podcast is brought to you by Aldis International, supplying your expert AI and digital transformation staffing needs across the US and Europe. Today, you are listening to our AI in Action series, where leading minds in AI from across the world share their story, success, and advice. AI in Action cuts through the hype and explores the true impact of artificial intelligence in our world today. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Nick Opposer. Nick is the Director of Computational Biology at Kronos Bio. Nick, welcome to the show. Great, and thanks for having me. Yeah, we're delighted to have you. So, Nick, let's start with yourself, please. Could you give us a bit of an overview of your background in technology, from where you got started, some of the roles you've held along the way, and and take us up to today as the Director of Comp Bio at Kronos? So I'm originally trained as a molecular biologist. So I started out finding and characterizing genes involved in inner ear development and inborn deafness. So my first bioinformatics project, if you want to call it that, was to try and identify regulatory sequences of a gene with a very specific expression pattern. So there were a couple of problems here. So chiefly that it was 2006 and I didn't know how to code. But also, I was working in Zebrafish, and so at the time, that was a model system which had an incomplete genome. I solved it eventually by comparing genomes of different animals, vertebrates, which showed me that there were some conserved regions around the gene, which were the enhancers, and so I could clone those out and drive the specific gene expression pattern that I needed. And so I enjoyed that a lot, and I went on to do a postdoc in systems biology at Harvard, and that's where I really started coding and using machine learning a little bit as well. I developed a method to use high throughput sequencing, which was nascent at the time, to uh, quickly identify mutations and use those to map candidate deafness genes in the genome. So then from then on, I did a stint at the Broad Institute to do a little more in-depth bioinformatics and get some street cred, as I like to say. After that, consulting in bioinformatics and methods development and some work in the pharma industry doing translational bioinformatics in oncology. And so that's, I think, where the first more serious encounter with machine learning happened. I was part of a team there that started analyzing real-world evidence to build predictive models for virtual clinical trials. So that you would call that a synthetic control arm nowadays. And so it was a collaboration between data engineers, statisticians, and bioinformaticians. And we had ambitious plans, but in the end, we spent almost all of our time on data cleaning and formatting. There is a is a 2019 Forbes interview that with Nara Simhan, who's the CEO of Novartis. I like to quote where he saw, uh, refer back to, he's talking about bringing tech and AI to, to Novartis. And he said, it took them years to just to clean the data sets, which I believe immediately. So I joined Kronos in 2019 because I wanted to go back to my roots, right? And look into gene regulation and be in more of a researchy environment. And in 2019, we just began scaling and getting ready for clinical trials. And so I was employee number 17 there and the first computational person on the team. You, you've brought us through your journey. Tell us about Kronos as a business. Who are Kronos, who you are, what you do? So Kronos Bio is a clinical stage biotech company in the oncology space. So we're discovering and developing small molecules specifically to drug transcription. And so Kronos Bio started in 2017 when Angela Kohler spun it out of MIT really to industrialize her <clears throat> drug discovery platform or really a screening platform called uh, the Small Molecule Microarray or SMM. So it's a it's a very uh, innovative and you know fascinating way to screen for small molecules in a cellular context. And again, happy to expand on that in a minute. But more on Kronos, I said we're clinical stage uh, biotech and we're focused on transcription. So we have three assets in the clinic right now. Fast forwarding to 2022, <clears throat> the three assets target transcriptional circuitry. Two are in phase one, two and one is in phase three. And so 
in terms of indications, two of these trials are in AML, and the other one is just generally in relapsed refractory solid tumors. So all of these are, you know, very nasty diseases to have. And for AML, both of the acids really target the same circuit that is very active in this particular type of blood cancer, where there is a transcription loop that's driven by some kinases, primarily the spleen tyrosine kinase SIC. And it's defined by these really, you know, persistently high expression uh, of transcription factors, HOXA9 and MIS1. So our drugs target this kinase to shut down the loop and kill the cancer. That's one way to target transcription. So our other, or third, I should say, acid is an oral CDK9 inhibitor named KB0742, which will hopefully treat patients with solid tumors addicted to oncogenic transcription factor. And here, we're particularly interested in MEC which you know has been discovered decades ago and uh, acts like a gas pedal in a car speeding up cell growth and division ramping up key cellular programs and it's a very very frequently dysregulated gene in cancer it's basically the usual suspect like when cells do bad things or grow too fast is usually close by I want to spend some time now understanding Kronos's use of AI and ML and how it impacts to, to your function and your team's organization. A lot of what you talked about there is the, very much the scientific side of what you do. Explain to us where AI comes into play and how you and your team are using it to make these discoveries. One of the beautiful things is that uh, computational work and the computational biology is really a key driver of our pipeline. Every step of the way, from target identification, validation, the high throughput screening, generally hit discovery, hit to lead, lead optimization, all the way to IND and even trial support. So even though for trial support, we then have a translational data science team, which is independent of my team. but. You know, first and foremost, I would say we are the tip of the spear in target identification. So we have developed our own approach to map out these transcriptional regulatory networks, which includes various machine learning approaches as well. In order to do that, we integrate essentially different layers of omic data, right? So RNA-seq, so transcriptional data, then genomic data, protein data, there's chipseq data, epigenetic data. And what we generate as we fold in those different modalities is what we call the five layer beam dip. So we have some sports fans here. And uh, the five layers are directness, regulation, interaction, dependency, and drugability, right? And so, so we draw all of these different data in and we, we fold them in together. And so, yeah, in order to build our networks and create and predictive models of, of gene regulation and genetic net networks that are annotated with the right data that will allow us to target specifically key nodes in this network that either may not be visible by, let's say, traditional approaches to target identification, maybe because there, there's little literature on them, or, or maybe they are difficult to drug, right? So we're operating in a space that's traditionally thought as undruggable targets, right? Transcription factors are not often not well structured, and so they're not amenable to targeting with small molecules. And so it's a really difficult problem, but it's becoming more tractable and there are different approaches to get at that. And so one of the, the ways that we're using machine learning is to compute the, the regulatory inputs of these transcription factors, either by other transcription factors or by cofactors. And so this is where it becomes really interesting because many cofactors are in fact tractable with small molecules. And so being able to identify the cofactors that, that interact or regulate these transcription factors that we know the cancer is addicted to basically gives us our map of our targetable landscape. So yeah, I would say in a nutshell or very high level, this is various approaches that we use machine learning for. 
Excellent, excellent. Um, your role, obviously, uh, as the director of Compoio, you oversee uh, the, the whole function and you also partner with your colleagues who are on the data science and on engineering as well. Could you describe what the role entails? How, how big is the organization as a whole from when you first launched it and what the journey has been like to get it to where it ha is today? Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> it's been it's been an exciting journey, really. I like to say it's working for Kronos is like stepping into a time warp. It's uh, you step in and suddenly it's a year later, two years later, three years later, and so much happens on the way. So it's just an, it's just mind boggling and exciting uh, every day to to go to work or telecommute. So I came in <clears throat> as employee number 17. And so it was very much a garage band at that time. So we were in an incubator and just a couple of desks and a small lab and it was very yeah, a familial, you know, exciting startup atmosphere. And then we were already scaling. I guess when I joined, we started to scale. And so people were joining rapidly. And I worked from the start with chemists, so medicinal chemists and a computational chemist <clears throat> with biologists, lab biologists and biophysicists or physical biologists, as well as the translational folks. So our chief medical officer, for example, was thinking about biomarkers for the trials and so it can be a little bit crazy when you first join and you're the only data person there first of all trying to see what data is there to get a hold of the data to corral everything and then to get bombarded with very different questions from all directions but again like if you are in that in that headspace or if you're if you're ready for that kind of dynamic action it's absolutely thrilling and very rewarding and so then as we were growing and we were planning out, mapping out the responsibilities of the data team and starting to bring in infrastructure people for IT as well. So the team started to grow and I started hiring in junior folks at first, although with master's or PhD in bioinformatics. So people who could help with the programming or some of the data analysis, yeah, one by one, essentially. So, so one of the things I like to do is everybody on the team has their own, their own particular process, uh, which, which means that there is a particular, there's a clear responsibility and there's also a clear, I would say, skill set and, and detail knowledge that's generated. And so I, and people, I think, like that because, yeah, it, you have a, you know exactly where you are in the organization and how important your particular process or your method is uh, in the overall a picture of the organization and, and of the drug discovery effort. You are listening to the Aldis Podcast. When you're looking to scale your team or if you are interested in showcasing your company in a future episode, reach out today. Or if you're in the market for a new role, visit our website to view open positions, www.aldis.com. What I'd love to talk about now is what's next for Kronos when you look at the next 12 to 24 months. You've obviously been there from the very beginning, very humble beginnings, and you've built it to a size now where you're very successful and there's obviously more growth in store. Can you talk to us about the, what the project roadmap looks like for the next 12 to 24 months and how that will impact headcount, particularly towards the areas of AI, machine learning, data science, and comp computational sciences, of course. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So... <clears throat> I'm very excited about the next 12 to 24 months. Again, it's been, it's an absolutely thrilling ride. And so what has happened as we've scaled, right, from 17 to 100 is where we are right now, is of course that programs have consolidated and we have mapped out a process for refilling the pipeline and really generating new drug targets and exploring them, validating them, following through, right? And so as these processes have can shape and consolidate it, I would say we're in a really great place to, to refine upon them, right? So we're adding the next layer of polish. And so for our machine learning, what that means is, is that we it is time to refactor the code and maybe add more sophisticated models in certain places or even bring in additional layers of data. And so one, one layer that I haven't talked about, which I'm very excited about, is also real-world evidence. And so that in itself is a source of data that I think over the last few years has really made tremendous progress. And so now we have teamed up with another company and a real-world evidence provider named Tempest, 
So they're one of the largest real world evidence providers, and it's really tremendous what what they can do. So we've aligned with them strategically. And so really mining into and integrating this real world evidence, which does have like patient outcomes, right? And you have the treatment regimes, you have the molecular data, and then you have the outcomes. And so really integrating that with our models, I am very excited about because really one of the challenges is that you can generate a model in your computer, right? But you don't really know what happens once you go into the clinic. And so having that clinical data to, to be able to build your models with that and having the direct comparison between what happens in a cell line or in an animal and in an actual patient with that disease is just, just amazing. So that is something that will certainly happen or continue to happen and ref to be refined over the next uh, one to two years. And then we have you know, new programs that we're bringing into the clinic, hopefully in that time frame, that require quite a bit of, I would say, analysis of epigenetic data that, that we will use machine learning. One other thing you asked about, how does that impact the team? So I have to say, I was very lucky that I, we're now, there's now five people on the team and plus myself. And so we're actually the largest team, single team uh, at Kronos. And so that in itself is, I think, quite remarkable for a small biotech to have this much computational support. And that allows us to do a, a lot of different things. And it, I think it really speaks to the change in the environment, the excitement around machine learning, but also just the importance of computational work in biotech generally. So we are, at least for the next year, I think we will stay where we are. That's the plan. And then if the financing environment gets more favorable, let's say, and we are moving towards additional clinical trials, we may hire in additional people preclinically. And in the meantime, I also see our translational data science team growing, which we very closely partner with, but which is led by a fantastic colleague of mine. And so she's currently, or she's just hired a data scientist to help with the translational biomarker analysis. Nick, thank you so much. Final question from me then. Given the growth that you just referenced and the impact that that will continue to have on headcount, I would love to understand when you're speaking to candidates about the opportunity, the mission, the culture at Kronos, what is it that you tell them that gets them excited to join you guys over some of the other great companies out there currently hiring? Yeah, it's a great question, especially in a very competitive environment. It's it's not easy to get the right people to join and great people. Everybody is looking for the rock star data scientist or bioinformatician or the 10x engineer or whatnot. I talk about culture pretty much right away. I mean, <clears throat> we have a mission and our mission is to stop disease and cancer cutting short lives. So that's our mission. We believe in that mission. And we have core values that we really believe in that that make Kronos Bio what it is. And, and which is a great place to work. And so being driven by that, by that mission and by those beliefs is something that I feel is very important to communicate. And so you can simplify that. I like to break that down into saying very simply, there are really two things we have to get right. And so both are equally important. So one, we need to get the science right. If we don't get the science right, there will be no benefit to patients in the clinic. The drug doesn't work. And two, we need to get the people right. So if we can't get the right people to work together, people hate each other's guts or their work. It doesn't matter how much money we have or how good the science is, we will fail. It is critically important that you get the right people <clears throat> together who people are excited about what they do. They believe in what they do. And usually that is a very good predictor of being good at what they do, right? If people love what they do, they tend to be very good at it too. So rather than asking them, oh, you know, prove that you're very good at what you do, I will ask them what excites you about the work? What was the hardest thing that you did? And so why did you do it? So to get at that motivation, because the other thing is, especially when you work remotely a lot, and I think it's very important to have flexibility in the workplace. I'm a big fan of hybrid work, or at least enabling, giving people the option to be flexible. If people aren't self-motivated, internally motivated, there's really nothing I can do as a manager to motivate them. I'm not going to poke them every five minutes and say, hey, are you still working? Are you still working? That's ridiculous. So people have to want to do the work 
and be excited about the work. And yeah, having those shared values and the belief in the mission, I think is really what drives that. And you can see it, right? We do daily stand-ups. That's one of the things that we do just to have a, just the tiniest amount of structure in the day. So in the morning, you know, we'll dial in, we say, hey, good morning. What's up? How are you? What are you working on? Do you have any issues, any questions, anything you want to help with? That will do. And then we have our weekly meetings and it's very important, right? So the social cohesion in a company, I think, is also is really critical. I said earlier, you know, the people, you have to get the people right. And as a data science team, or bioinformatics team or Compire team, it, it is just critically important that we are connected to our stakeholders, our colleagues, I like to look at them as stakeholders, right? So it's really about working hand in hand with the scientists, which means understanding the scientists and understanding the needs of the scientists and also building the trust, right? In these cross-functional teams and where people think differently and talk differently. And it takes a little bit of time and you do need a little bit of face-to-face -face time for that as well. So it's important for me that it's clear that um, you can be a vampire programmer and write your code at 4 a.m., right, if that's if that's what you do. But you do have to spend a little bit of time with your stakeholders as well. And so they, they know you a little bit as a person and, and there's an exchange and then there is to trust that if they have a problem, they can come to you and ask you ideally before they design the experiment or before before it's too late. Nick, thank you so much for coming on today and talking to us. Great to learn about your own story. Great insight into Kronos and the work you're doing there as a computational sciences team. The use of AI and ML is 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 interesting. And then the growth of the business uh, sounds very exciting. So we wish you, the team, everyone at Kronos, the best of luck in the months and years to come and look forward to having you back on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Aldis Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any Android podcast of choice. You can also head over to our website, www.aldis.com, to listen to more podcasts, view our open roles, and stay up to date with industry news. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more great episodes coming very soon.